Reserve Franchise Tax Board. The board has a longstanding position in favor of federal conformity. Mr. Chair, Member Scott Governor about the California Wind Energy Association. This measure is crucial to the renewable industry because we need certainty for the financial markets in order to finance our projects. And we have to know if California is going to have a 9 percent premium on projects done in the state, which is why we strongly support this measure. Thank you. Michelle Peelsticker, California Taxpayers Association. We strongly support this measure. Uh, it's not a perfect measure by any means, but that's what you get when you have a 121-page bill with multiple provisions. So we strongly support the concept of conformity, and uh, we appreciate the author's efforts to bring it forward. Thank you. Chris McKaylee, uh, California Aerospace Technology Association supports it, and we've worked. Uh, we've had no conformity bill in five years, and uh, two prior vetoed bills. So we're pleased to support this measure. Thank you. Aaron Nemo, representing the Large Scale Solar Association, the Association of Utility Scale Solar Providers, and also here uh, speaking on behalf of the Solar Alliance, who are the photo photovoltaic providers uh, and developers. Uh, we support the bill, and actually we believe for the large scale projects alone, without this bill, we put 21,000 jobs related to our grant projects in jeopardy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Benton on behalf of Cannon, Cannon Power Group, a uh, wind energy company located here in California in support. Chair, are there any other uh, witnesses in support? Because I'm actually opposed to the measure. Any other witnesses in support, Mr. Smutney Jones? <coughs> uh, thank you. Jan Smutney Jones, Executive Director of uh, Independent Energy Producers. We strongly support this bill as a, a job uh, ma uh, making bill and urge your support. Thank you. Very good. Any additional witnesses? Witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chair, members, David Wolf here with the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and uh, we're opposed to SB 401 uh, for the reason that there are numerous what we see as tax increases in this bill that each total separately tens of millions of dollars um, in the next three to four years. And um, because of those individual tax increases, we do believe that this measure violates Article 13A, Section 3 of the California Constitution, otherwise known as Proposition 13. And that section of the Constitution states, quote, any changes in state taxes enacted for the purpose of increasing revenues, um, in short, requires a two-thirds vote of the California Constitution. So for those reasons, we are opposed to the measure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional witnesses in opposition? DOF, do you have a file? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Miriam Ingenito with the Department of Finance. The bill. Um, would result in revenue losses totaling $21.8 million, 21 million dollars in 2009-10, a revenue loss of $14.023 million dollars in 10-11, and $15.01 million dollars in 11-12, and $5.51 million dollars in 12-13. Very good, thank you. Members, we are still in a subcommittee format here, but we are happy to entertain questions for the author if anybody has any, members. Very good hearing and seeing none. I would uh, encourage my colleagues to the, attend room 4202 if you're on the appropriations committee so that we may establish a quorum. Senator Wolf, we will take a vote on the matter as soon as we establish a quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair you're and welcome. members. All right, we're also looking for Senator Pavley, uh, our next author.
Senator Pavley, uh, come on up as we are establishing a quorum uh, so you can get situated. Very good. It appears that we have a quorum. Madam Secretary, uh, please uh, check our attendance, please. <coughs> Fuentes? Here. Conway? Here. Amiano? Here. Bradford? Here. Alderon? Cotto? Davis? De Leon? Hall? Harkey? Miller? Nielsen? Here. Norby? Here. Skinner? Here. Solario? Torlickson? Here. Torrico? Very good. We have a quorum. Senator Pavley, you are presenting on SB 77. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And we're sort of waiting for a few witnesses. So we like to start on time here in the assembly. Senator, thank you. <laughs> Duly noted. Someone was driving in from San Francisco, however, but I am here on time. Thank you very much. Uh, members, uh, Senate Bill 77 is, is a voluntary program. Voluntary for homeowners whether they'd like to participate in energy saving improvements. Voluntary for businesses. Move the bill. Voluntary for local governments. It's a PACE program, Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. It's been modeled extremely well in, in Berkeley, Palm Desert, Sonoma County, and others. Uh, what will this do is establish a state program to aggregate um, uh, these cost-effective improvements for homeowners and small businesses in the Secretary of State's office. And by putting them together, um, we can bring down the financing costs, making it even more affordable to provide energy efficiency or solar panels or a variety of other options that the homeowner or business may want to achieve energy efficiency savings from. This bill is almost identical to Senate Bill um, X826 with two main differences. There is no prevailing wage requirement in this bill and it only applies to residential developments of three units or less or commercial projects up to 25,000. Again, this is a voluntary program. With these amendments that have changed from the extraordinary session bill, this was the exact bill that passed unanimously off the state senate floor uh, a month or two ago. To remind you this bill, what this bill does, it creates a new program in the state treasurer's office in the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority, and which will administer a reserve to make local PACE funding more attractive. The bill authorizes a $50 million reserve fund that can be used for qualified PACE financing programs simply as credit enhancements to further lower financing costs to bor borrowers. Funding for this voluntary program comes from the CEC, which has confirmed that there is sufficient money in this fund for the reserve. And this is both an appropriate source and using these funds will not have any impacts on other state energy programs. The state has no exposure and is not liable for any defaults or loan-based obligations. The state is simply aggregating the loan bonds for private sector uh, investors. If any problems occur with the funding sources, of course, this is an assessment or lien on your property. It stays with the property owner. All of that will be um, going back into the fund. This is just a credit enhancement part of it that will, make, will gather interest and allow this program to continue. The CEC is uh, very supportive of this creative option of making financing for energy efficient improvements um, more available to homeowners and small businesses. You know that's the major hurdle for people going forward and making these investments and this will facilitate that. With me today is uh, Bob Epstein um, representing our sponsors, uh, Environmental Entrepreneurs E2. Very good. Thank you, Senator. Witnesses in support. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Bob Epstein. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of E2. I'm a director at New Resource Bank. I just want to emphasize that the goal behind this bill is to take cities and, and municipal activities in your districts and make the cost of financing energy efficiency and renewables lower. I've checked with uh, various bond agencies that are looking at doing programs like this by September of this year. They believe this will lower their cost of financing to your constituents by at least half a percent. And again, this has no cost to the state. In fact, there's a net state benefit. Our estimate is that this will generate about $68 million 
in revenue through um, through um, equipment um, sales tax and through payroll taxes, and will generate somewhere between 10 and 20 thousand jobs when the program is fully enforced. So, the you know the opportunity is immediate, and I urge your support. Thank you. Very good. Additional witnesses in support. Ed Barons on behalf of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors in support of the bill. Any additional witnesses in support? Uh, witnesses in opposition? Seeing and hearing none, Department of Finance, do you have a file? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the bill would use the renewable resources trust funds that come from public goods charges paid by investor-owned utility ratepayers to benefit those persons who do not pay the fees. Our other concern with the measure is that it would transfer $50 million from that fund, um, which is continuously appropriated, and while the fund um, there are those funds in the account currently. There are other obligations that currently exist, including the new solar roofs program, which is expected to spend about $400 million um, by 2011. While there, we do recognize there's a downturn in the housing market and the new home constructions, however, because the requirement remains in statute, we believe that this obligation does exist, and it would result in a $20 million shortfall to the fund. Very good, thank you. Colleagues, do we have any questions for our author? Hearing and seeing none, uh, Senator? Mr. Chairman, I just would like to thank the author. She's very cooperative in working some concerns out in the bill, and, and I certainly appreciate that, uh, that working with you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it having the time to discuss this with you, um, Assemblymember Nielsen. Um, may I just add something in the close regarding the uh, California Energy Commission uh, money uh, using the renewable trust fund money. Uh, that's just uh, money set aside uh, sort of on demand, if that's the proper term, through the treasurer's office as a credit enhancement. It stays under the jurisdiction of the CEC. Um, they are supportive of this. We've worked out that concern with them. And again, uh, any defaults or things are backed up on the uh, property assessment um, and lean on the property, if you will. So monies will come back. We we um, perceive that uh, interest could be earned on this, and it'll stay under the jurisdiction of the CEC at all times. Very good, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call a Republican roll call. Conway. Oh, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Norby. Uh, the bill has been amended. My, my concern with this, though, was not with the prevailing wage part, which was taken out. Prevailing wage has a rationale. If there's going to be government money, then there needs to be all kinds of purposes that go with that. But creating a new program and, and continuing to carve out soft subsidies uh, for these, uh, ultimately, if green technology is going to work, it's going to have to be financially viable and something that people want to do on their own because it's going to save them money. And I've seen a lot of these programs where we're subsidizing uh, loans or guaranteeing them uh, with this technology. And it seems to give an impression, which I hope is mistaken, that green technology can't survive without carving out special privileges and subsidies for it. Uh, I'm a free market guy, and all of us know up here, ultimately these, these things have to survive or fall based on market conditions. Uh, and if they really do save energy and do save money, uh, uh, then uh, that's where they belong rather than us continuing to, to uh, do this. So that's, that continues to be a concern. If there's any other discussion regarding that from you or anyone else I, up here. I would I'd like, like to, to respond, if I may, and then allow um, Mr. Epstein to briefly respond. First of all, it's not a loan program at all, but uh, Mr. Epstein it's is more a loan <laughs> guarantee program, right? Go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so first of all, Assemblymember Norby, I completely agree with what you're saying. So let me explain why I think this is a good idea at this point in time. Um, what this is, this is private to private. There's a private, there's private money being raised. It's being loaned to private individuals, and you have to provide a reserve against delinquency and payments. So the state is providing that that area and it's getting paid back what it does. The reason why I think it's appropriate at this point in time and not necessarily in another is I can tell you as a banker there is a credit problem in California in, this, in the United States overall at this point. Our goal is to get interest rates down to a point where all of these things make sense. We think the magic number is about 7 percent and this is a temporary measure to help get that rate closer to that point once things take off 
then this is no longer needed. So we are dealing with a credit problem at the moment, and that's, that's why I think this bill uh, deserves your support. Any additional okay. questions, All colleagues? Right. Hearing and seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call a Republican roll call. Conway? No. Conway, no. Harkey? Miller? No. Miller, no. Nielsen? Aye. Nielsen, aye. Norby? No. Norby, no. Very good. That measure, the measure passes. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, members, we're going to go back to SB 401. Uh, we heard the committee, uh, we heard the bill in a subcommittee. Um, we need a motion to. Very good. The bill has been moved by Mr. Solorio, seconded by Mr. Amiano. That bill is out on a B roll call. Very good, members. Thank you very much. We're in adjournment. higher education, it gets $3 back in increased state taxes. So edu higher education is a great investment. I can tell you that developing countries like China and India are investing a huge amount of money. In some cases, they're providing college education free to, to those individuals. They're not doing that because of just benevolence. They recognize that the economy of those nations are dependent upon educated personnel. And I can tell you without question that the state of California is going to suffer greatly if it decreases its investment in higher education because our greatest resource is not our, simply our natural resources, although they're great, it's our human resources. That's, that's what's made this state great in the past. And that's what we'll, we'll have to do is continue to invest in the future. Thank you, uh, Chancellor. Uh, Mr. Gould, thank you uh, very much for being here this morning. Appreciate your uh, participation. Uh, please begin. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Co-chairs uh, Negretti McLeod and, uh, and Ruskin and members of the committee, uh, thanks for inviting me to be here today. You know, it's, it's really fitting as we look at the 50th anniversary of the master plan for uh, we to be taking a detailed and self-critical look at how this whole uh, plan has worked and whether we've lived up to what the authors intended. In 1960, our state leaders had the foresight to envision a system that had its core values of affordability, access, and quality. Clearly, the current financial situation is, is putting a severe test on those three uh, criteria. Let me start by um, giving me my absolute bias, um, and I think it's one that all three of us share. And I, I think the higher education is the wisest investment the state can make. As I look at our future, uh, as California's future, I can't envision uh, a prosperous California without a healthy higher education system that support the development of good jobs and a strong economy. I'm also a former director of finance um, in my misguided youth. and. Uh, <laughs> I have, I share and I understand the serious challenges you face financially as you try to put this budget together and to establish priorities. 